a blog epic whereby I could have all over the world said about what they did in a, in a given day. I think a lot of them like me actually made stuff up about what they did on that actual day. But, um, I'm going to try and give an overview of the sorts of things we get up to within um, MOLA, Museum of London Archaeology, um, on, on, in terms of the, the applications that we, that we apply. I work um, as the technical director, I'm really looking after the IT side of things that we do there. I'm not going to bore you with all the day-to-day -day stuff about keeping the infrastructure going and renewing things and all the 60 help desk calls we get a week because that's a little bit boring. Um, but instead concentrate on some of the sort of issues and the, the small projects and the larger projects that we do um, as we're going along and then end up on one sort of um, important point that I'd like to try and make. Um, okay, uh, start with some archaeology. This is Bucklesbury. Um, if you're um, in the modern, uh, in the modern front, you can see um, the, the, the towers over there. That's the, that's the city of London. You've got Mansion House right in front of you. In the Roman times, and even now, where you can't see it, at the end of the site there is a very uh, the Walbrook Stream, which is one of the two streams of London going to the Thames, which is on your right. Um, we have discovered a great deal of information from these um, from this particular site, in particular a lot of finds, because wherever by the Walbrook Stream we can we can reckon on getting about five metres of, or six metres of waterlogged stratigraphy, so we find loads of lovely things, like all these copper alloy um, Roman finds, a terrace sticking the rain through a wolf's head pendant from a, from a, uh, a cavalry um, harness, tiny one centimetre amber gladiator helmet, and my favourite of all, a fist and phallus um, lucky charm, and the finger is doing what you think it's doing, it's a very old sign. Um, but the problem here for computing was that um, we process things in a certain way. Things get washed, they get bad, they get labelled, and then they fill out one of these things. And we had a, had a person turn up who wanted to change all that, and we got involved in, in, in getting rid of these things, these fine files. So we fill out this, and we do a lovely little, little drawing over here. Um, but instead of doing that, we're now putting it into our system for all, with, all the, with all the registered finds going into one place, and they're also taking photographs of them. That is what I class as a little change. But it's a little change that even on Bucklesbury, where we're expecting 6,000 finds, is probably going to save us in the region of £20,000 in terms of the time it would take people to fill up those cards, which they now don't know what they need to do. I'm going very fast, I've got loads of stuff to talk about. Um, these things down at the bottom, Roman glass coins, loom weights, these are, these are types of registered fine which will always get an accession. But some types of fine don't, like clay pipes. Sometimes they get accessioned if they're really nice, most of the time they don't. So what we've done with this is we've now, we've now brought them, we've normalised that information such that the information that's common to all, the registered fine information that you see up there, is caught there. And then anything that's specific to the particular type of fine, so for example, we've got so far as Roman glass, is recorded over here. Now, if all these have been recorded in the same way, and assuming we save a one minute on, on, the, on the information we've been inputting again, there's about another £16,000 worth of saving gets there. I'm saying this because we have to think in these terms all the time. It's a very, it's a very sort of tough world out there when it comes to fines. I'm not going to talk about this too long. Um, single content recording, that's a little red book that um, Chis wrote. It's quite big here. It's actually a little red book. It's about that big. It's indestructible. We're trying to revise the way in which we do um, our context recording uh, um, on, on site. And it starts by thinking, are we recording everything we should be recording? And are there some things we shouldn't be recording anymore because of the changes in technology that have taken place, like GIS and so on and so forth? The big idea there is really for us to try and get, as Chis will tell you, um, it's so important to get people thinking about what it actually is. Actually recording the, 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 the details, the objective details about the particle size or the colour, all these sorts of things, is a, is, a, is a means to get people thinking about difference and change and nuance and all these sorts of issues. So by employing IT on site, that's the sort of thing we want to try and get people interested in. We've gone through the process of, of denormalising it and working out what all the common fields are and so on and so forth. But that's the point we want to get to. Um, another little job, okay, our desktop um, desk-based assessment people. They're doing a lot of work with HGR data. A lot of the HGRs are in a bit of a mess, so there's a lot of cleaning up that has to be done. Um, and they just wanted a mod, uh, means, a quick means of creating what they call a super monument, which effectively was just taking some existing polygons and putting a big polygon around them. So that required making of a little tool within RGIS for them to just apply it. Save a little bit of time, make it a little bit more uh, sufficient, efficient. They often, the desk based team, will go out to buildings like this and they'll go along and take lots of pictures of them prior to the planning application going in. And this is the general way they are, they are doing it. It's only computerised because it's a PDF of a handwritten 
um, of a handwritten uh, uh, text. So there's a little bit of OS data over there, and you can see, not very well, but there are little arrows and numbers over there saying where are the images that have been taken. Why are we doing like that? Why don't we start taking pictures of things like that using um, online GIS, as sort of been mentioned already. Um, so we're doing some experimentation here of taking, um, in this case, RGS online, um, which can be run on, a, on, a, on an iPhone with an Android or an iPhone app. Um, and essentially, you can go to a place and you can use a GPS receiver in your little, um, in your little uh, device, and it will record a point where you're standing, and then you can define your own data fields to record and the validation that goes on in those fields, all within the GIS. It, it's immediately uploaded to the cloud, which Steve will tell you all about tomorrow. Um, and when it's there, you can immediately see it on your GIS back in the office. So you hit tabs on what everyone's doing, um, and your attribute data is there straight away. So you can move much, much faster to the final report. Slightly bigger project, um, 1746 John Roke's map of London, 24 sheets. Um, this is a project we did in association with the University of Hertfordshire and Sheffield. The big idea here was to take an existing um, uh, resource, the Old Bailey Online, which you can go and look up and find out what your ancestors did and were tried for at the, uh, at the Old Bailey, um, and take the georeference information that they had, which was simply georeference to areas on each tile, i.e. a pixel reference, not a real reference, take that information and put it into the real world. And that involved taking, the first step, taking a big map like this, getting rid of all the spaces and putting together each, each panel, and being paper, of course, <coughs> they would have walked and stretched to different parts, different values, so we had to do a lot of very careful authoring in order to get a, a seamless um, coverage. And then taking that perfectly good map, we did nasty things to it by georeferencing it, so it became very skewed. And there's a very interesting story about why it's skewed in the way, but I can't, I'm not time to tell you about that at the moment. But we ended up with this, and then the big idea here was that we wanted to have a geographically accurate image of the street network of 1746. Um, and while it's walked quite, quite there, if you, if you were trying to overlay that um, on the, um, the modern mapping, unless you did a, a very extensive rubber sheeting exercise, you will see there are a lot large areas where it just doesn't agree because of the nature of the cartography, because of the method of, of, of surveying you were using at the time. Um, so what we had to do is we had to um, <laughs> develop uh, a street network based on the first OS, um, first, second, third epochs of the um, Ordnance Survey data for the area. So we used that to guide us picking up the information from the reliable mapping. Okay? And um, we came across some problems. Do you imagine, of course, was the OS mapping was done 100 years after the, after the road maps, of course, some things have completely disappeared. So we came up with this problem of what we call the Holborn Viaduct dilemma, which meant Holborn Viaduct completely different um, between, the, between the two maps. And that's after, that's before. And um, how do you, you can't obviously digitize the new layer hold on from the OS maps because it's not there. So you then have to rely on the road map. And to do that, we just um, generated a technique called micro georeferencing, which basically meant you take loads of points around the immediate area of interest, and then that area will be very tightly locked together. The rest of the map will be all over the place. We're not interested in that, We're just interested in that one area. Um, so we ended up with a conjoined network of street, which allows you to do this which was very, a very good QA device in order to allow you to, um, to ensure that you had a conjoined topology and actually quite of interest to the, um, um, Tim Hitchcock from University of Hertfordshire because of navigating through, the, through the, the city at that time and moving along. They're often telling us about tax collectors' records where they say going down one street and taking the third alley on the left, which will very often not have a name. Um, so it's a, it's a way of, of, of navigation. As we recorded each street, we recorded the width of the street and we recorded the presidents of the street. So we take the cheap side here, um, Buckersbury, out of interest, it's just down here. Um, and uh, we took our street network for that area and we would expand it using a GIS process, buffered it out until we had a buffer which represented the width of, of, of cheap side. More or less, it doesn't have to exactly, exactly overlie. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and then. Uh, You'll see, so you should also say that there all these, all the, it's only one layer deep, so where all these streets buff up against each other, they have been clipped. Another GIS process, just to, just to clip, the, clip the data. We 
We then had that um, data set about location from the old Bailey people. That's what those points recognised. Now, that point told us that that thing was Cheapside. That whole polygon was Cheapside. But what they really wanted to get at is having a finer level of detail because so much historical information is recorded on the basis of street and parish or street and wall. So you get lots of people doing their research, you know, how, much, how many pints of beer was drunk per person, um, and it's by parish and ward. So if we can get that information, then we'll be able to um, geo-enable those various data sets. And these are data sets which people can down, download. Um, so what we then did is we took that large one, and we did another cookie-cutting operation, as we call it, with the parish layer, which are the black lines, in order to come up with a point within each of it, so we've got cheap sites and Peters, cheap sites and Mary's, cheap sites and Mary River, etc., etc. So, um, and the other benefit of doing it this way, I basing your 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 your, um, your street network on actual geography, is that we could then repeat the exercise for an earlier map. So this is old will be in Morgan, so 1640, 52, I think, um, 100 years earlier. It's obviously, the, the city is quite a bit smaller by then. Um, but we were able to take the layout because most of the streets are in the same place and it becomes then an editing exercise to create a 1652 version of it and, and, and then concentrate on how roads have changed or names have changed in, in the process to create a similar thing. Something completely different. HGR data. This is looking at the desk accessibility. So this is a pilot project looking at two parts of London, looking at HGR data and seeing what needs to be cleaned, how does it need to be Need to be changed. There's some example there of, of, of monument polygons and points. Um, um, but we thought, well, we could try and do a little bit better than that. Um, let's, because they're interesting in an urban archaeology database and an urban deposit model. I, where is there stuff left in the city still to dig? Um, um, and um, so we were playing around. These are really only ideas at the moment. Flying around, taking spot heights from the modern OS master map data, creating a surface from that, and then comparing it with a lower level of data based on um, geological um, borehole investigations, deposit survival forms that we fill out whenever we do an excavation, which is where you find natural or not, if, if, you, if it's um, truncated layers. Um, and, and having those two layers um, together, and then trying, trying out punching through building footprints through that layer, um, which at the moment we just did in that little exercise with a standardized depth. But, um, as we, there are building, there are basement surveys that do exist out there, which are maintained. And if we could, if we could digitise that information, then we'd have a very good idea of where the holes are. And, and as you can imagine, in London there are still slithers of archaeology surviving here, there, where there's no two-storey basement or something like that. Um, uh, another example, again, trying out a technology which has been, um, which is, which has been uh, possibly applicable. I-Space, I don't know if you've heard of it, if you've, if you've listened to the CAA, you've probably seen this caption on the left, Jeff Byrne, talking about the I-Spaces, and we thought, well, could it work for us? So we tried it out, and um, this is a, obviously an open area site, so the modus operandi here is that you would come in and you would strip the whole area of the machine, take off the topsoil, and then generally we would spray paint the features that we find as an initial survey of what's there. They then get dug and half sectioned and so on and so forth. So we thought we'd try this out here. Um, as a, as a first pass, but the question is, um, how does it work in the sort of environment where we're often working? So here you can see in a bit more detail, what's going on is these things are spinning around and turning out a little thing, and you wander around with one of those poles, or a small thing, and it works out where you are. It basically turns your site into a big digitising tablet, that's the best way to think about it. But it's a very expensive digitising tablet. Each one of these costs about the same price as a, as a, as a total station. Um, but the, the point was we were assessing it, we were, we were trying it out, we were seeing it work within our environment before we decided whether or not it could make us, make us any savings, whether it would be economic for us to do it, how long it would take to pay back on the investment and so on. And there are various things that popped up in the process of that. Uh, we, we record context outlines, obviously when we're planning, we want to know about real edges, i.e. as dug, as they were dug in the medieval period, and unreal red edges, the little red bits where truncation has occurred. Yeah, so we ought to know about that, so it's important for the system to be able to allow us to do that easily, which it wasn't really at the time. Um, but we also, to the UCIS, we want to get polygon, closed polygon data sets out of it as well, so that also needs to be something the system needs to do. We, we needed to have something that you could bolt onto the side of a, of a camp piling, because if you, if you 
if you've got um, any of these things sitting in the middle of the site where there's people going, this is Buffer's room, we've got 50 people on here at the moment. These things will get kicked over in about three hours, they reckon, because that's what normally happens. Um, simply not robust enough, so if we can have something we can mount on the piling um, around the edges of the site, then we've got a, uh, we've got a, a, a nice, safe way of doing it. Um, oh, and yeah, little things, like you can't operate the little um, iPads that they were using with PPE, and, and if you're not wearing this stuff these days on these commercial sites, you will get thrown off site. You have to really abide by all these rules, so you have to sort of develop uh, fingerless gloves and stuff like that, so you can actually operate the thing. We also had some problems about connectivity and so on, which um, you know, other people have m mentioned. Um, another thing, finding out whether or not it would be accurate enough to record um, those yellow spray-painted um, features that you saw in the, in the previous slides using one of those little things. So there's me holding a very expensive bit of polystyrene, which is basically a layer plane, um, and you can, you can uh, use these, these computer-controlled dr drones, um, and they basically make up an auto mosaic, just as uh, Jerome was showing just now, but, but, but from the air. Um, you put in your ground control, you can get very good um, precision, we think. This is an example from, not London, uh, this is uh, Mer in Turkmenistan, where um, the Institute of Archaeology have done a fair bit of work. But what we were interested to know was how accurate could it be if we're not going to do it using this sort of technology, dual frequency GPS, um, smart net real time kinematic survey, we can expect two and a half centimetre accuracy um, as, we, as we're going around features like that. But um, if, we're going to, if we're going to use the author mosaic and then do heads up digitising of the features that we've seen when we're back at the office, um, what sort of action do we have to get in order for it to be equivalent to what we're, what we're, what we're achieving there? So, so we, it was Christmas, so we made a Christmas pudding. And we went around that quite a few times with the same GPS group to get an idea of how much variety there is just in inter-observer error. And the long and short of it is that the, um, the accuracies that you'd expect just, the, or sorry, the, the inaccuracies you'd expect just because the GPS location is moving around within a circle of about five centimetre um, diameter, um, is often exceeded by the, the, by the difference with people putting the point in a different place. But that nonetheless gives us a, 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 a target to aim at in terms of other techniques we might use to do the same sort of thing. <sighs> right. Now, this is the point I wanted to make. Um, uh, it's been alluded to already, but uh, this, is a little, um, this is a little graph showing the different sectors um, from the IFA uh, four yearly uh, profiling of the profession survey that they do. Um, and it shows you the, the amount of people working in the different sectors. Now, it's not surprising that most archaeologists are working in, in the commercial sector, like LP and, as, and ourselves. Um, and the thing that's been going through my mind is how, how is it that what gets done, what gets talked about in conferences like these, and I was saying to, uh, saying to Stuart when we were talking about this process, um, I haven't got anything really big and shiny to talk about because often a lot of the papers in the CAA are about amazing things people are doing, really great things that people are doing. But my question is, if we take, uh, if we take a car as an example, as an analogy, you know, you, you've made the clay model, you've actually done the mock-up, it's been approved, you've got people writing about it in the, in the magazines and it's now going to get to the showroom. But how do you get, how do you get the amazing things you're talking about into, into the marketplace? These, the, this, this graph at the top shows you, in terms of person days, where most of the field archaeology is done in the country. And that is a logarithmic scale on the left. So you can see 662,000 well, person days spent in the field. So if you've got technology that is, that, that, that's applicable to field archaeology, you, you should come and talk to the people in the commercial sector because it will actually get, it will make a difference. You know, you, 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 you will make a difference the way archaeology is done in this country. That site of Bucklesbury up the road, that's going to end up with about, um, probably about 10,000 contexts. And that, that's a fairly big site, I understand. Now, that's 2,000 more than two decades of, of, of excavation in Chapel Ahoy. You know, the big research excavation with all these different techniques which are involved. It's a, great, it's a great thing, but the point is, if you've got stuff and you want to implement it and you want to embed it, you come, come in to talk to, talk to us and, and easing the process of communication would be a great thing. The bottom two pie charts just give you an indication of, of how much time, if you like, people within the commercial sectors have to just try stuff out, a better way of putting it, 
I'm not saying that people in universities just sit there trying stuff out without any, without any, um, uh, uh, um, without any problem. Of course they don't. But the, the thing is, you know, we have to be competitive. We have to be funded. If we run on 82% productivity rate, which means people have to uh, assign their time. They're all filling in timesheets in order to be chargeable, in order to um, meet our obligations, in order to be able to afford national insurance and pension, and hopefully on, um, uh, uh, raises at the end of the year. All these things need, need, need to be think, thought about. Um, so we know about things like knowledge transfer partnerships. They've been going since 1975. I started the Museum of London through one of these, one of these things. Um, uh, and the different funding bodies will, will, will all often be talking about um, how to get in funding by being uh, in association with, with a commercial organisation. Uh, so the, the point being that they want your research to get out there and to, um, and to uh, uh, make a difference. And I say your research, I mean 70% of the papers in these two days are coming from people within universities. So for the thir other 30% I'm, 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 I'm talking for you, if you like. Um, Impact, impact on archaeology. How do we, how do we, how, how, how can we make a difference? Um, this popped into my inbox when I was thinking about this. this is an example from uh, a, a Scottish initiative, as far as, far as I know, um, about uh, working with working with commercial partners to make the most of people who are doing master's degrees in in, in any subject. Um, but, uh, and, and you might well may, might well be the case that um, after someone says, "Well, there's these great things going on. You should go look at this. You should go that." So by all means, uh, email me if there are some things which. Uh, there are some initiatives already there which, which, which will allow a closer working relationship to, to, to go on. There, there are so many interesting problems for us to solve out there, which we often don't have the time, time to look at. There's one example right there. Uh, this was mentioned um, uh, and by Chis. A lot of developers don't like you talking about what you're doing behind those hoardings because they're, because they're concerned they might get bad press. But how do we go about convincing developers that it's good for them to, uh, to, to let us talk about what we're doing and, and how do we prove that we're going to do it in a responsible way? What are the me methods and techniques that we could use to try and, to try and encourage them or their operators to, to, to do it properly? Um, and there are other benefits of working with the commercial sector um, because at the end of the day, a, a lot of people um, in the archaeology department are, are going to be making use of our data. So this, um, the osteology database that we have up there, that was something that was done with, with the Wellcome Institute within the Museum of, uh, from the University of London, and it's produced some, some great data. You know, there are 16,000 burials in there now, and there's about 1.8 million bones recorded um, for that, about two and a half million traits recorded about those bones. Great data sets for people to work with. Um, and back to that point there, better and leaner operations, a healthy commercial sector. I would argue that it's important for the university sector to think about the health of the commercial sector because at the end of the day, I know not everyone who studies archaeology goes on to be an archaeologist, but it would be lovely to try and make things more efficient, make things more profitable. I mean, we're, we're, we're a charitable organisation, we don't have shareholders, it's all ploughed back in, but to make it profitable so we can start diggers on something more than £18,000 a year when they've got a three-year degree and, and £30,000 worth of debt or whatever they're going to have to leave you know? So um, it's a good thing to get together. And the final, um, the final thing I make is that, um, as again was alluded to before, um, it's all very well making systems leaner and more efficient and doing work more quickly, cu cutting the time it takes to process which defines by 57%. That's great. But it only really works in a buoyant market because as soon as you've got those people, 57% of their time, they have to be able to do something else. We have to be able to charge them to something. So how do we go about doing that? I think it's to do with diversification. I think it's to do with looking at different ways where archaeologists can do offer different services to different people. So, um, Digital Diseases Project, we can end up with about 6,000 bones of all the horrible uh, scans, sorry, 3D scans, of all the horrible things that happen to your bones when you get diseases. Um, and the real market for that is a, is a clinical market because, of course, they, they don't see this stuff these days. Um, there, there aren't so many incidences of sort of horrible things that happen to people in the medieval period. Locating London, which is what the Rope Project was all about, you know, the, 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 the big audience there is histori his, historians, historical geographers. And then this final slide down here, um, uh, diversification into the angry bird generation. Um, we've, got, we've, got all these, uh, we've got all this information, we've got all these interesting stories that we would, we would love to tell, and there are, there are going to be great ways in which we, we could tell them. So one of the things my, my boss is interested in is, is, well, are there ways in which we can make games out of the stories that we've, that we've got to, to, to try and get people 
get people into it. And there is something going on in May when, um, in this area, what, is, what does Cameron call it, the, 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 the Silicon Roundabout. If you go outside, you're very likely to get knocked over by someone wearing a black polo neck shirt, square glasses, and a single speed bicycle. They're all web, they're all web designers and game designers. Um, and they run this thing every year, they take it over. Um, and what we're saying to them is, we've got all this stuff, how could we make it interesting to people? So trying to, trying to get out and reach people in that respect as well. That's it.